So this is the second massive lie. We're going to cover one more when we get done with this lie. But this lie, will unpack our baggage here, one or two sessions here. The second lie is this lie of living a crowd-sourced morality. It would be, what I mean by that is this. Let's say you've got 20 people that you know that don't know Christ. They're all going to have opinions on everything. Time, eternity, moral values, homosexuality, you name it. Everyone's going to have opinions on everything. So let's say that you're a person who doesn't know the Lord, and you ask each person what their opinions are on a number of topics. And then what you do is you, it's almost like a survey. You take, that, you take that data and you kind of put it into a blender, and a long story short, you say, okay, well, it seems like the most common responses to my questions were numbers one, two, three, four, and five in terms of moral values that people seem to believe and adhere to. Okay, so I'm going to take those. See what I'm saying? That's a cross cut. It's a cross section of moral values, really, which is essentially just people's opinions. Now, people's opinions are based upon nothing other than exactly that. So if you are clueless as to what the real truth is, you may as well just survey 20 people around you that you meet on Main Street or in a mall or at, the, at your job and say, what do you believe about these crucial issues of life, time, eternity? And say, well, okay, the top five responses is, okay, then that's what I'm going to believe. See, that's crowdsourcing. It's almost like, Lord, in Jesus' name, whatever fish I pull up first, I'm going to name my child that. Because, you know, in other words, you're fleecing in a, the silliest of manner. Well, crowdsourcing is not a whole lot different. You have to understand that there are people walking around with belief systems. I won't even call them structures. Most of them are just belief systems. They're just a system of ideas that really don't have much depth or structure to them because they, they themselves have sourced, crowdsourced those ideas and those values. And so at the end of the day, what they wind up telling themselves is, look, it seems like everyone has come to believe this, so how could all these people be wrong? And if you don't have God's word, you have nothing to refute it. You have nothing greater than the opinion of the crowd, the opiate of the masses. Well, look at what Jesus said about this stuff. How many of you know that God's word will outlast everyone's opinions? He is not remotely interested in the opinions of men. They have come and gone, even Voltaire. The French philosopher Voltaire, his life mission was to eradicate Christianity and destroy the Bible. Now today, his mansion in France is a Bible publishing center. See, he's dead and gone. And the Lord laughed from heaven. You will never stop my word. You will never stop my purposes. Who are you? But he made it his life mission. And when he drew his last breath, unless he repented, the devil was there to meet him. Mocking him instantly for believing the ultimate lie. And it's too late. Now a person legally belongs to Satan. It's a legal transaction. Well, look at what Jesus said about all these opinions of men. He told the people, you can enter God's kingdom only, circle that word only, because the, the way Jesus lays out is not a way, it's the way. There aren't 15 different ways up this same spiritual mountain, and we'll all get there somehow as long as we're sincere. I can be sincerely wrong. I believe you know I can be sincere as sincere can be by getting on an on-ramp to 91 North and I'm going to go to New Haven. I'll end up in Vermont long before I'll ever reach New Haven. But I was sincere. I got tricked. 
I'm going to sue the highway department. Of course, nowadays, that probably, they'd probably win the suit. But um, <laughs> You see, it was my foolishness. It was my assumptions that got me wrecked, got me right. lost. Right. I just assumed that sincerity would get me to my destination. No, it's sincerity plus right directions. Sincerity plus truth equals a pretty good map. Now, Jesus said, you can only enter God's kingdom through the narrow gate of life. He said, now, conversely, the highway to hell is broad. Man, it's like the, it's like the Atlanta, like I-75 going through Atlanta. Seven lanes, man. All full of traffic. Anybody ever drive through Atlanta? Man, you better be careful the time you drive through Atlanta. Because what would take you an hour, you'll be there for about four. The highway to hell is broad. And its gate is wide. That's why it seems so believable. That's why it's so easy to enter into that highway. Because... You know, the gate is wide and the highway is huge. Right. Why would anybody want to go on the, uh, the Merit when you could go on a seven-lane expressway? Well, it depends on where you're going. Right. Jesus said the highway to hell is broad. Its gate is wide for many who choose that way. You understand that it's a choice. People will choose to believe God's word. They'll choose to believe the message of Christianity, or they choose not to. In other words, they just choose to believe a crowd-sourced morality, a crowd-sourced, mutant, mutated theology. Well, look at what Jesus said. But the gateway to life is very narrow. And that's why some people don't like it. That's why they don't choose it. That's why they choose it temporarily and then pull back out. In other words, back down the on-ramp. Why? Because they come to understand that if you want the heaven that Jesus is promising, you're going to have to go through some stuff now. You're going to have to live a life to some extent of self-denial. You can't live like the world and expect heaven as a reward. You've got to choose. I mean, is this something strange? No. Joshua said it in Joshua 24, right? Right? Choose this day whom you will serve. Now, he even told Old Testament folks, well, guess what? The same choice is laid out for us today in the 21st century. They had to choose then. We have to choose now. People have to choose now. Not only what they're going to believe, but in whom they're going to place that belief. Jesus said, the gateway to life, be forewarned. It's very narrow. And the road is sometimes difficult. And only a relative few will find it. Now, when he says few, you have to understand it's a relative term. Okay? It's a relative term. A whole lot of people have found it. But with regard to over against those who have chosen the broad way to destruction, it's relatively few. Why? Why? Because the devil's ultimate lie to humanity is, don't believe that God stuff. It's fairy tales. It's fables. Uh, it's all designed to just crash your party. Life is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be about you. It's supposed to be you executing your own plans and your own will. After all, life is short, so enjoy every minute of every day. Now, that doesn't sound like a really toxic or evil message. And it may not be toxic or evil classically but where it will lead you will be away from christ because nowhere in those exhortations is the lord so it gives the deceptive illusion that life is about us when it's really about him so it depends on what highway i'm going to go on if i want to reach my destination i got to get on the right highway I mean, it's really not complicated in that sense. Jesus said, few will find it. Now, let's go on our introduction here. Here's the basic lie. 
that people believe that the best morals are a crowdsourced morality, that the best morals are crowdsourced. And it's, they couldn't be farther from the truth. Because Jesus refuted it by saying this, when the blind lead the blind, they all go in the ditch together. So much for crowdsourcing. I was watching this. I love these video shows on TV where they do these crazy videos. And there was this motocross event. And you know, going, and boy, and he goes down, you know, off this uh, it was like a dirt mound, only to realize that it really wasn't a ramp. It was a straight drop, of about 15 feet. So the first motocross bike goes. The next guy, who's probably a second and a half behind him, whoop, and there were about 20 bikes all piled up. Why? Because they saw the first guy go, and everyone else assumed that that was the way. That's how it happens. That's how it happens. And people in influential positions, when they spout reckless, irresponsible, anti-Christ stuff, millions of people automatically become to believe that. But look at what God's word says about this basic lie we just uncovered. Jesus, I'm sorry, Paul said, do not be misled or deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. Guess what? Uh, Sourcing the wrong people will corrupt good theology. Or keep you from sound doctrine. I mean, it's incredible how many people believe in heaven and how few people believe in hell. Hell has severely lost popularity. Well, isn't that convenient? So you understand what's kind of inbuilt into that assumption is this. As long as I don't believe it, it doesn't exist for me. Isn't that an incredible level of deception that works within the human psyche? And guess who's watering that idea? The devil. As long as you don't believe it, it doesn't apply to you. Just be a nice person. Just be a good person. You don't have to believe all this Bible stuff. That was just written by man, and it's an archaic book that should be in the Smithsonian. You see, and people say, oh, yeah, okay. Ah, For a while there, I was convicted, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. Now, look at the key question I put in your box there. When we look back at our lives, how often did following the crowd make us look like a clown? Can anybody look back in your life at least once and say, man, I was stupid for following that crowd. I did it because I was goaded to do it. And especially with guys. Guys are hugely susceptible to this. I mean, if you don't do this, you're a... And guys, there's no end to the list of names. that. And when guys hear certain names, man, they just, you know, they'll jump off a building. Say, I showed you. (laughs) Watch. (laughs) I'll kill myself rather than let you call me that name. Uh, So peer pressure is a huge thing, isn't it? I just want to read you some statistics from the Centers for Disease Control. And I'll just kind of randomly um, give you these stats. By 15 years of age, more than 50% of teenagers have had at least one drink. Now listen how it ratchets up. By the age of 18, the figure increases to over 70%. And that now is included, drugs are included and all that. Well, why the jump? Because the older that we get as a teenager, the more susceptible we are to darker things. Concerning, in the paper called The Body, an AIDS resource, it was found that 33% of teenage boys between 15 and 17 consistently feel pressure to have sex, whereas 23% of teenage girls feel pressure to get into sexual relationships, and too often they succumb to that. 55% of teens confess to having tried drugs for the first time because of peer pressure. They didn't even necessarily want to do it. 
In Canada, 70% of teens who actively smoke said they started smoking because of peer pressure on behalf of the friends around them that smoked. 19% of teens reported they would, now listen to this, they would discontinue using their cell phone and texting while driving if their friends stopped as well and not before. I don't even get that. When you stop getting in wrecks, so will I. I don't, I don't really understand that. 3.1 million American teenagers smoke. Guess what? Number one reason? Peer pressure. The Kaiser Foundation say 50% of adolescents between 12 and 18 consistently, according to the survey, feel pressured into having sexual relationships. Now get this. Teenagers now are infected by 4 million STDs every year. Now weed and our authorities thinking it's a great idea. It's a great idea. Weed's a great idea. It's not a gateway drug. That's nonsense. It's a great idea. Why? The almighty dollar. It's pathetic. But the use of weed among teenagers has written risen rather by a staggering 275%. Primarily, according to respondents, peer pressure. 9.5% of teens have tried cocaine. Why? Peer pressure. 32.2% of teens try their first drink before they're ever even 13 years old. Why? Peer pressure. <laughs> and 25% of all teens and something like 61% of all college kids have been involved in at least one episode of radical binge drinking. Why? Yeah. So you can see that why I said all that was this. Peer pressure is the same as crowdsourced values. You're letting the crowd around you tell you what you should do lest they call you a name that you don't like. And so you succumb to it. You do it. Now look. In the house of the Lord, in the kingdom of God, we need to, which is why we do our part here. How about you, parents? Amen. We put God's word into the kids as soon as they can understand stuff. They're being taught in there as we speak. But we can only supplement what should be going on at home every day of the week, parents. Amen. So you better get it together. Because we will never, we could never take the place of the primary caregiver in their life. Right, right, right. Ne nor were we ever meant to. And I'll even go this far. In nine cases out of ten, a grandparent can't even take the place of the primary caregiver in a child's life. Right. Let's say the primary caregiver is not a Christian, imparts nothing. Nine cases out of ten, the grandparent's efforts do not bear the fruit that they're, they're hoping and believing for. I don't mean to bum you out with that. I'm just trying to keep things in perspective. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, grandparents. doesn't mean you shouldn't do your best because you want to see your grandchild or your grandson or granddaughter grow up to serve the Lord, even though who's ever their parent, whoever the primary caregiver is not doing that stuff, it doesn't mean that they're a lost cause doesn't mean all is lost. You do what you can do, but don't live in constant frustration because of what you're seeing that parent not doing. You got to trust God at some point. You can't take on the whole burden of that responsibility. It's not going to work, and it's not yours to take. It's very sad. It's sad and pathetic when that goes on like that, but it's, it's a real life thing. Now, how many of you ever, how many of you know or have experienced maybe in your life that peer pressure, you're looking back now, became a horrendous and horrendous governor of so many people's behavior, especially young people. We know that. Think about it that you just observe teenagers nowadays. They all want to dress the same, talk the same, look the same, buy the same things, because that's the in stuff to get. Wear their hair the same, and now, you know, get the same or similar tattoos uh, and all this kind of stuff. But now, 
Okay, that is what it is. But now, I believe we're in a much more dangerous place in that now this stuff has invaded the area of thought, opinion, conclusions, and moral value. There was a time in America where a lot of that was insulated against because there was a system of values. There was an underpinning of biblical values that kept America afloat. And you could, this is evidenced by this. When I was a kid, I remember everyone that I ever knew subscribing to uh, the notion that some things are just right and some things are just wrong. I mean, it didn't take a whole lot of debate. Now, try it. Just try and have a conversation about that with somebody. That's the devil, see? He's demonically manipulated and crowdsourced a whole mentality, a whole theology, a whole moral system of moral values that's based upon nothing other than popular opinion and ease of comfort. Consider how, I want you to just consider this. This is real life. Now, if you want me to talk about pie in the sky, I will, but I'd rather talk about real life. What do you want me to do? Consider how all of a sudden, seemingly, and we know it's not all of a sudden, it's been about 25 years now, but we've reached a definite tipping point. All of a sudden, for example, if you believe that homosexuality is wrong or that there's sim- something simply fundamentally wrong with the Russell Library in Middletown having drag queens reading books to children, if you think that there's something just fundamentally wrong with that, all of a sudden now, be, get ready, you're a bigot, you're a hater, you're a narrow-minded, maybe even a right-wing d- domestic terrorist. <laughs> see, that, that's the way, all these names now. I'm gonna throw, we'll throw them all and see which one sticks. There's just something wrong with that. Now, why would, why would a group of people bring a drag queen in front of children? To normalize it in their little minds. To normalize sin. To normalize perversion in their little minds so that by the time they're two or three years older they say oh yeah no that's fine what do you mean it's wrong no that person was really nice they read me a story so this is a horrible thing that's happening it's a horrible thing and i need us just to live with an awareness that this stuff is all around us and you need to watch out like paul told timothy Take heed to yourself and to your doctrine that everyone around you that hears you will be safe and will grow. So take heed to yourselves, your families, your doctrine, what you believe and why, and certainly impart that to your children and be involved in every facet of their lives. Know what's being rammed down their throat. Be aware of what's being rammed down their throat what they're being indoctrinated with, and stand up against it. Is that wrong? If you don't want to, then don't. Then try and raise your kid as a Christian and let them believe all these lies at the same time. And one day they'll look and say, well, why are we picking picking and choosing these things? You never said anything for the first 10 years of my life. You were too busy on your phone. Now, how did this happen in America? Well, because collectively, we've drifted away from the moral and biblical values that used to at least govern the general direction and moral and spiritual compass of America at one time. But now, it's been replaced with this progressive agenda. And guess what the emphasis of this progression is? Let's progress our nation beyond these antiquated values into a new enlightenment. It's crazy. But guess what? The Lord's going to have the final say. He's going to have the final say. That's why we're at a point now where, as I said, only revival can save us. But I believe that's exactly what will. This, This progressive message is essentially saying this. We don't want and we will not submit ourselves to some God 
or some book that tells us how we should live, what we should believe, and the values that we should embrace or abide by. We won't have it. I've never seen a spirit of rebellion as is evidenced right now. Never seen a manifestation of rebellion on every level in every arena. I want you to listen to these thoughts excerpted, number one, from the Satanic Bible, and number two, from, from uh, an interview, uh, an excerpted interview with a, from a Satanist, high-level Satanist. You say, why is he reading from the Satan, Satanic Bible? You'll find out in a second. Anton LaVey, who was the founder of uh, the Church of Satan, he's now gone, but here's what he wrote. He said, I and we break away from all conventions that do not lead to my earthly success and personal happiness, which includes the scripture you understand. Then he wrote also, there is nothing inherently sacred about moral codes. Like the wooden idols of long ago, they are simply the work of human hands, not some God. And what man has made, man can destroy. Man is his own God. Now this is from the article. <clears throat> He was a Church of Satan high priest. Here's what he wrote. What we essentially believe is that life should be lived in the pursuit of pleasures. And we only get one choice to do it, one chance rather to do it. He goes, at, listen, he goes, it sure sounds like modern America to me. It's an interesting way that Satanists are describing modern America. And what's even more disturbing is why they're considering now America a satanic nation and not a Christian one. You know why? Because what the Satanists see at work in the collective moral values of America is exactly what's quoted as the fundamental principle of their Bible. Here's what it is. Do what thou wilt. In other words, eat your thing, baby. Do whatever you want. That's the entirety of the law, close quote. That is the key, keynote scripture in the Satanic Bible. Do whatever you want. Don't let anybody tell you that there's something wrong with that. That is the entirety of the law. Remember what Jesus said? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and then love your neighbor yourself. That is the whole of the law. The Satanic says, do whatever you want and love yourself. That's the whole of the law. So what I'm saying is this, the Satanists equate independence from God and the Bible with Satanism, doing your own thing instead of obeying God's word. This is exactly what the serpent offered Eve. Guess what? Independence from God. Satanists define Satanism as freedom from God's laws. Satanists say this, in America, we can legally do wickedness without repercussion. Tell me it's not our satanic nation. So they simply define Satan as, as the pursuit of worldly pleasures and personal happiness. If it feels good, they do it and they say, welcome to Satan's America. Whoa. Can somebody say, whoa? whoa. You got Satanists cheering America on because it's on the path of destruction. That's right. That's right. You got Satanists already saying, we've already won. Now they haven't. But they believe that so many markers are in place that morally they have won. Whoa. All right, let's go to Roman numeral two now. Now that's just introduction. <laughs> Why? Because the Bible says we should not be ignorant of the devil's devices. And I'm going to help you not to be ignorant. You want to be ignorant? You'll have to try to. <laughs> Doesn't mean you're an ignorant person. You know what I'm saying? Ignorant, that means uninformed. You're going to have to try to be uninformed in this church. Just we're not, we can't come here. 
and just say, oh, God loves you. And that's going to make everything better. Listen, we live in serious times. We live in serious times. Serious times require serious measures and serious people. This is, this is a war out here. It is a war. The lies that Satan is producing are incredible. Let's go. Mining out the truth now. Here's what Proverbs 16, 25 says. There is a path before each person. Now circle these next two words. It seems right. If it didn't seem right, they wouldn't go down that way. It gives the illusion or the impression or the indication that there's something all right, okay, permissible, and even uh, something that should be desired uh, along a particular pathway of life. Now, what if God's word says it's not right? People are falling into this delusion that as long as I believe that it's right, and of course Satan is right there making it seem right. I remember... At one time, two women asking us about same-sex relationship that they were involved in. And uh, they wanted to know what the church's position was. And so we said, well, we can give you the church's position, but what you really should be asking is what's the Bible's position. Well, no, I want to know what the church's position. Well, I'll give you the Bible's position. Well, we went back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. Sounds like a congressional hearing. (laughs) And I said, the reason why I'm sticking to my guns is that we believe, as the church, what the Bible says. So it really wouldn't matter if I told you what the church's position was. If the Bible says something contrary, we're all in trouble anyhow, so what's the use? So then, all right, all right, all right, Well, what's the Bible's position? I said, the Bible's position is that you're in sin. However, let me quickly put an asterisk on this. Well, what's that? I said, this issue of homosexuality is is usually lumped in with a whole bunch of other sins. There's a whole lot of things that are sin. The majority of which, in the remainder of the category, can be construed as heterosexual. I said, so... Don't think that you're in a unique situation. Because if someone in fornication or someone in adultery is considered to be in a sinful situation, so are you. So they still, you know, one of them in particular still was irritated at that. And so then they they went, now listen to this, they went the emotional route. Well, we've been together for 19 years. You You trying to tell us we don't love each other? I said, absolutely not. You probably do. And they went, you're not going to try and tell us we don't live with you? No, that's stupid. Why would I do that? Uh, okay. I said, but that has nothing to do with your question. Well, what do you mean? Because you're coming with, with pieces of emotional stimuli and let you, let you cl- yet you claim to want a spiritual answer. You want a right answer? Ask the right question. I be, you, I, we've been together longer than most heterosexual couples. Congratulations. Still sin. Well, we love each other. Good for you. Still sin. Yeah, but, we, you know, we, we, yeah, good for you. Still sin. So we went back and forth. Why? Because you can't ask an emotionally charged question and want a spiritual answer. See, when, they, when I came down to the emotional plane then they understood that I'm not trying to talk them out of of, uh, the notion that they have feelings for each other. I love the way Rick Warren put it. He said, the Bible doesn't tell you who you can love, but it tells you who you can have sex with. So you see what I'm saying? That there, there are people can rationalize away God's moral code. Because, but don't you understand? We care for each other. We've been together. Good, great, good. Go go ahead. Look, that's not my beef, lady. The Lord says it's sin. And why should it be okay for a heterosexual 
to be judged as being sinful and your situation is somehow unique. Won't fly, won't wash. We're all on, we are said, we are all under the jurisdiction of the Bible. That's it. So you asked, your beginning question was, what does this church believe? This church believes what the Bible believes, and I've just told you what the Bible says. So I might as well just tell you the rest of the story. <laughs> so, so they said, well, pretty much like we can't stay here. I said, how long have you been coming? About two months. I said, two months? Okay. Have you enjoyed the services in two months? Every one of them. Have you heard me get up here and try and make a living every week of bashing homosexuality or homosexuals in particular? No. We, don't even, we can't even remember you getting on that. Number three, I said, have you been made to feel welcome, warmly received and welcome? Yes. Did anybody judge you? Not that we know of. Is anybody giving you the evil eye, the stink eye? <laughs> no. Have people greeted you? Yes. Have you liked the worship and the word? Yeah, yeah, yes, 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 yes. I said, so what you're saying is where we should have been judgmental, where we should have been critical of you, where we should have been mean to you, we were anything but that. But when God's truth crunches your lifestyle, now we're like this. You see, if we had a spirit of judgmentalism and legalism, don't you think someone around you probably assumed by the way one of them looked that you may have had some issues going on there in that lifestyle? Well, maybe. And yet no one said a thing to you other than love you. So you can't have it both ways, lady. But I said, you can leave if you want. I said, you can leave it if you want, but you'll never be able to leave this place saying, I got judged, people insulted me, people were mean to me, people did it. No, we treat everyone with respect and love and dignity. However, the scriptures have the final say. Amen. If you don't want that, I can point you to a whole lot of churches. That won't give you any problem at all. Probably make you an elder. <laughs> but it won't be this one. Wow. See, there's a path that seems right unto a person. For them, that's the path that seems right to them. Why? Because of emotional stimuli. Probably because of things that happened to them way back in their childhood. That's another story. But the Bible says, but the end of that path that seems so right will always be death, physical or spiritual or both. How many of you remember the old soul song by the Isley Brothers, 1969? It's your thing. Do what you want to do. I can't tell you who to sock it to. <laughs> yeah. Real funky song. I liked it. <laughs> but you see what that was speaking? It was speaking the overturning of the moral values that had been in place, generally speaking, up to that point in time. The destructive, demonic 60s. I, I'd like to know how many STDs came out of that song alone. <laughs> That's what I want to know. Because that song embodied a philosophy. And if you look back on those old nasty hippie days, everything was about love. And guess what? It was all about free love. Remember Stephen Stills? Can't be with the one you love, just love the one you're with. Oh, yeah, thanks, Steve. I'll see your wife next week. But you know the destruction that came out of there? Drug addictions, overdoses, deaths, STD. It was an explosion of destruction because 
the doorway, the hatchway to hell was open. And when you open the hatchway to hell, you'll never get it closed again. And that's what's been destroying America for the last 50 years. Because now we're two generations deep. Look at the fruit of it. Didn't come out of nowhere. All right, let's finish with this little section. We're done. So which one of these, dear friends, will be your life statement? See, our culture says, I want to do whatever, wherever, whenever, with whomever I please. A Christian must say this, Lord, I want to do whatever you want, wherever you want, whenever you want it done, and with whomever you want me to reach. Amen. And here's what God says, I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life. Now look at the implications, that both you and your descendants may live with that blessing. I want to give you this last blank because I want you to sleep tonight. <laughs> so here's God's enduring principle. Ready? Limits equal love. Limits equal love. When there's no boundaries, when there's no limits, that's not love. You're actually setting that person, that child, whatever, up for destruction. See, we got a lot of rebellious people in the world today thinking that life owes them a living just because they exist. Amen. Why? Because no boundaries, no limitations, no instruction otherwise when they were still pliable clay. So let's get it right, okay? Let's do it right. Because as Christians, we've got to stand out from the nonsense of this world. Praise the Lord. Let's stand, everybody. Hey, I'm Pastor Petey. And I'm Christina. Thanks for watching today. Let's stay connected. First, click the thumbs up on this video. Next, click subscribe. And lastly, click the Give Now link in the description to support the ministry so that we can continue reaching people all over the world. And if you're in the area, we'd like to personally invite you to join us right here in Middlefield, Connecticut and see for yourself what God is doing with our church family. Thanks again for watching.